So we've introduced an exponential map that takes any old matrix and returns us an invertible matrix. So I'd like to write this in a more symbolic way. And it turns out there is a symbolic way of writing the set of invertible n by n matrices. And it's this, you write capital G L N R, where n is the size of the matrix, r is telling us we're using real matrices with real coefficients. You could replace this with c if you're working over the complex numbers, which we sometimes will, but just for concreteness, let's stick with r. And the gl stands for general linear. So this is called the general linear group. Why general linear? Well, linear maps are basically the same as matrices, right? So a matrix defines for you a linear map and a linear map comes from a matrix, if you pick a basis. So the word linear there is telling us we're working with matrices and the word general is because, well, it's talking about invertibility. So a general matrix is invertible. It's quite a special condition that you're not invertible, right? The determinant has to actually vanish. If you start with some matrix, you perturb the matrix entries a little bit, the likelihood is the determinant will suddenly become non-zero. So a general matrix is invertible. That's the reason for the name. There's also a piece of notation for the set of all n by n matrices, and this one's going to look a bit weird. So you might be used to writing like m n by n r or something. I don't like that piece of notation. Um, a I feel like a better name for it is little glnr. Um, so the reason I think this is a better name for it is because what we'll see in this course is for any group of matrices that you write, let's say capital G, there's some set of matrices, little g, whose exponential lives in big G. It's going to be called the Lie algebra of G. And you know, whatever the name of your group is, whether it's SO or SU, or there'll be lots of these group names. The way you get the notation for the Lie algebra is you write little SO or little SU. And in reality, this is not really a little SU, or this is a math frac. It's like fractal font, Gothic font. Um, but I can't, I can't write that. That's not what my handwriting does. So I write it as little GL or little SO. Okay, so that's the reason for this weird notation. Anyway, this is just how we write the exponential map. It goes from little glnr to big glnr. And you might ask, can we define a logarithm? So a logarithm would go the other way. It would take an element of big glnr to an element of little glnr. Can we define a log map? Well, we can. But we run into the same kind of issues that we do already trying to define a logarithm for numbers. So remember, if this is the complex plane, you try and define a log map on the complex plane, you run into issues. Because if you start at, say, the point 1 in the complex plane, its logarithm is 0, right? Because e to the 0 is 1. But its logarithm could also be 2 pi i, because e to the 2 pi i is one, and four, e to the four pi i is also one. There's actually infinitely many possible choices of log for this point. And the way we get around this, of course, in complex analysis is we pick a branch cut in the complex plane. Well, so we slice a piece out of the complex plane, starting at the origin, going out along the negative real axis or any other direction you want. And we say, okay, let's take the logarithm of any number that's not in the branch cut. Then we can get a well-defined function, a single-valued continuous function. Um, but as soon as we cross that line, we have to change which function we're working with. So the same kind of thing is true for matrices, except maybe it's even slightly worse. So what's actually true is the following theorem. So there exist neighborhoods u inside little gln in other words u is an open set in the set of all matrices 
and this contains the zero matrix and V inside big GLN and this one contains the identity matrix such that the exponential map restricted to U sends U to V and is bijective. In other words, it has an inverse. So if you pick an element of V, an element sufficiently close to the identity, it has a logarithm which is sufficiently close to zero. So we call this inverse log. And this log map is very, very nice. Just like the exponential map, it's infinitely differentiable. It's actually got a Taylor series we can write down that converges. So it's an analytic function, which we'll talk about later. Um, so how are we going to prove this? How are we going to prove this theorem? Well, we're going to use or appeal to a result from multivariable calculus that I'm not going to prove. This is called the inverse function theorem. So I'll state the theorem and then I'll explain how to use the inverse function theorem to prove the theorem we want about the logarithm but I won't prove this inverse function theorem. So the inverse function theorem says, um, suppose F from R capital N to R capital N, don't want to confuse this N with the little N before, uh, is a differentiable map. Such that its derivative at the origin is invertible. So here's the notation d0f, this is the derivative of f at the origin. What is this? Well, it's defined to be the matrix of partial derivatives of f. So, th first of all, we can think of f as a collection of maps f1 of x1 up to x, x capital N all the way down to Fn of x1 up to x capital N. Right, so the xi's are coordinates on this first Rn and the f1 up to Fn are the components of this map in the second Rn. So what I do is I form the matrix whose entries are df1 by dx1 all the way up to df1 by dxn and all the way down to df n by dx1 and all the way across to dfn by dxn. And when I say derivative, I'm taking this derivative at the point 0, 0, 0, 0, so at the origin. I can't just write as 0. All right, so I could evaluate this derivative anywhere, but I'm, I'm going to be interested in a neighborhood of 0, so that's why I'm evaluating it at the origin. So suppose f is a differentiable map such that the derivative of f at the origin is invertible. Right, this is just an n by n matrix. You can check whether it's invertible by calculating its determinant, for example. Well then, then f is locally invertible near the origin and its image. So if y is the point to which the origin gets sent, Um, then there exist neighborhoods let's say u inside rn um, containing 0 and v in rn containing y such that f restricted to u lands in v and um, is a bijection. And moreover, F inverse, which exists because it's a bijection, is smooth. Or rather, differentiable, sorry. Right, so I assumed to begin with F is differentiable. We're saying the inverse is also differentiable, and actually, the derivative at zero, sorry, the derivative at y of f 
inverse is just the derivative at 0 of f inverse. OK, so the really nice thing about multivariable calculus, like calculus in general, is that it replaces nonlinear things like f with linear approximations like this matrix derivatives. All right, this d zero f is like the linear part of f in its Taylor expansion, so it's a linear object that approximates f, and then it proves theorems of the form. Assume something nice about the linear object, you get something nice about the nonlinear object. Here we assume the linearization of f, this d zero f is invertible. We deduce that actually f itself is invertible in some small neighborhood. So this is. A very nice theorem for multivariable calculus. And we're going to apply it to the exponential map. So first, how do we see the exponential map as going from Rn to Rn? Right, because the exponential map goes from little gln r, that is n by n matrices, to big gln r, that is invertible n by n matrices. Well, I claim that we could think of little gln r as a Euclidean space, as a vector space. It has n squared coordinates, which are the matrix entries, a11 up to ann. Um, so we can really think of it as rn squared. And similarly, gln r is contained in rn squared. Right, again, we have n squared coordinates, which are the matrix entries. So that's how we're going to translate uh, into the language of the, uh, the inverse function theorem. Now we need to calculate this derivative, uh, this matrix of derivatives for the exponential map. Um, so here we go. We've got to calculate what? Well, it's going to be a bit, a bit horrendous. Um, so when I write a matrix as an element of Rn squared, what I'm doing is I'm writing it as a vector instead of as a, an array. And it's a vector of height n squared. I'm just writing all the matrix entries vertically on top of one another. So the top row of this matrix is going to be the derivative of exp a11 with respect to the matrix entry one a11 then the derivative of exp a12 with respect to, sorry, um, exp a11 with respect to a12. And then I just keep going until I've done all the matrix entries. So the last one will be d exp a11 by d a n n. And similarly, as I go down the rows, it's the um, exp a ij that's increasing. And we just stick them all in a big long column. And the final one will be d exp a n n by d a 1. And then the last entry in the top, bottom right will be d exp a n n by d a n n dot 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 okay so that's a big matrix All right so if this is confusing to you think about what happens when n equals 2 so for the 2 by 2 matrix case you should get a 4 by 4 matrix of derivatives okay that's what we've got to compute and happily we know the Taylor series of exp so exp a is the identity plus a plus a half a squared plus dot 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 and I claim that all we need to know is the linear term here so when we differentiate the uh, exp a the constant piece coming from the identity is going to vanish and anything of order a squared when we differentiate there'll still be some coefficients of a left over and when we set a equal to zero in the end um, because you know we're differentiating near zero uh, they will go away so the only term that matters is a so we may as well assume that x a equals a for the purposes of this uh, discussion. So this matrix is the same as 
know, DA11 by DA11 all the way up to DA11 by uh, DANN. That's a 1 1. And then all the way down to DANN by DA11. DANN by DANN. Okay. Now, this is something we can actually cope with. We're just thinking of the matrix entries as n squared completely independent variables. So the only derivatives that will be non-zero are going to be things like da11 by da11. That'll be 1. Everything else in that row will be 0. Next row, the first thing will be da12 uh, by da11. That'll be 0. But the next will be da12 by da12, which will be 1. And then everything else will be 0. So actually what we get is the identity matrix. which is invertible, therefore we get, oh sorry, that's a dot dot dot, that's not a one there. That's dot dot dot. So therefore, by the inverse function theorem, near zero, um, near zero, we get that the exponential map is invertible and its logarithm is, uh, its inverse is called the logarithm. So remember, all of these things I was evaluating at a equals zero. Okay, another way of thinking about this, which makes it even more obvious, or makes it more obvious, because that was maybe a little bit non-obvious, is that if you take um, the Taylor expansion of f, you get f at zero, plus the first derivative of f, plus higher order terms. So in other words, d zero is precisely the first term in the Taylor expansion. So for x, you know, x of a is x of zero plus d zero applied to a, which is a. So d zero, let me write that out. That's d zero of x applied to a plus dot dot dot. And we know from the definition of x, this is equal to a. So d zero x a equals a. Okay, so that's what I mean when I say d0 of x equals the identity map. It's the identity map on matrices. Okay, so by this theorem there exist neighborhoods of the zero matrix and of the identity, and y is the identity in this uh, application, such that x is bijective. I just want to finish by saying that log, as we've just defined it, is analytic. It has a Taylor series. So if I take a matrix which is close to the identity, so it's i plus a little bit, then log of i plus a is given by exactly the same Taylor series that uh, I would use if i was 1 and a was a number. So that is a minus a half a squared plus one over three a cubed minus one over four a to the four dot dot dot. And here this is really one over two, not one over two factorial, one over three, not one over three factorial. We don't need the factorials in the bottom. Okay, so I'm not gonna prove this. This um, You can check this in the same way that you check it for numbers. Um, so, log is given by Taylor series and we're going to use this Taylor series in the next video when we talk about the Baker-Campbell-Hausdorff formula.